starting Judges. It kind of is just very fitting to start with Judges when we just finished Joshua because the books just really roll together. And you notice that Judges starts off by saying, now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass. So we're kind of picking up right in history where Joshua is leading, leaving off. Now, I just want to bring this up. A lot of what we're going to read here, we've read different portions of this, and there's different stories that we've already read. It should look very familiar to you in Joshua. And back when we we're in some earlier books of Joshua, I actually referenced Judges chapter 1 because they made sense to, to cover certain stories at that time from this passage. So we're not going to, I'm not going to re-preach things that I've already preached through on the book of Joshua, but to help maybe clear up your mind if you're looking at this and going, well, wait a minute, why would we be reading some of the same stories in, jo in Judges if it says this is after the death of Joshua? I mean, isn't the book of Joshua about the life of Joshua? Well, yeah, overall it is. But one of the things that we see throughout the book of Joshua is that the way that the stories are told oftentimes, in many cases, and you just have to be careful when you're reading the Bible to, to make sure you're understanding what's going on, is that it makes sense to kind of continue a story to the end. So when the Bible's talking about, say, the tribe of Judah and you know, gaining their inheritance, it could take them a really long time to do that. So it could give you the start of what's happening, like maybe in Joshua's lifetime, and then all these stories that can continue on even after his death, it doesn't tell you how long is going on in between necessarily. And that's why we get to see some of these things going on even though it's taking place after the life of Joshua. And there's, there's a few books of the Bible you kind of have to be careful about. That you read them very carefully and maybe even, you know, even just have to study them out to see, to, to make it make sense of, of the timeline of when these events are literally taking place. So I just want you to keep that in mind so there's no confusion as we go through this. Uh, that's a very simple answer. Of course, every single one specifically, you'll be able to see how it fits in. But we're not going to go, I'm not going to go in, into a lot of detail on, on all of these different timelines. But in general, what we're doing is we're transitioning from the life of Joshua to the life after Joshua, for the children of Israel. Um, so let's keep reading here in verse number one. The Bible says, Now after the death of Joshua came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And kind of along the similar point, though, with the timelines, you may also be thinking, well, last week we saw this great summary of how God has worked with Abraham all the way up through Joshua, right? And he gave this history and all of these victories that were won, and it almost sounded like all the battles were over, right? That's kind of the sense that you get, that, that sense of completion, like Joshua's old and well-stricken in years, and now all the fighting's done, all the battle's over, and and they're just going to continue on. And you can, you can walk away with that type of a feeling because in a general sense, that was true. In a general sense, like there was a time when the children of Israel were still engaging in these battles where the enemy would still come and try to fight against them, where they would band together and they would have to worry about other, you know, these wars and these other battles because they hadn't really secured themselves in the promised land. Right? They haven't really established themselves. So there's, there's always new battles and new wars as they're going out and kind of getting, gaining dominion over the territory in general. Right? Having their presence known, having, having control over the area versus completely finishing the job and going into the last of the cities and towns and areas to just completely remove the, you know, there, there's kind of two different phases. So when we read the sections of scripture that's talking about Joshua, you know, the land kind of being at, at rest and at peace during the lifetime of Joshua, it's talking about that general sense that they have established themselves over the land. But it doesn't mean that every single last fight that needed to be fought was done because not all of the children of Israel had gone into their specific inheritance and into their specific cities and completely just ousted the enemies 
in full. And we'll read some of these, uh, just some of these other passages so you know what I'm talking about. Um, look at Joshua 23. Just flip back a page to Joshua 23 in verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. So we see here, after they had gotten rest from their enemies, then Joshua is getting old. But in Judges, we're seeing, well, Joshua is dead, and now they're going and, and fighting their enemies, right? That's because, as I was just saying, they didn't have rest while they were still entering into the land. There's, there's kings were banding together. They're having these other wars, and, they, and, and it was a lot, um, a lot more stressful for them getting in and establishing themselves. Look at verse number two. It says, And Joshua called for all Israel and for their elders and for their heads <coughs> and for their judges and for their officers and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age, and ye have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that hath fought for you. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off even unto the great sea westward, and the Lord your God, he shall expel them. So there's not like a contradiction here, because even Joshua is saying it's not over yet. Yeah, you've got some rest. Yeah, you kind of, you have it more easy now, because God's given you rest in general, but you still have to go and finish the job. You still have to go get all of your inheritance. And he said, and he's still telling them, you know, the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight and ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised you. So what the Bible is doing, you got to understand the point of the perspective of what's being told at any given time. It, it, last week, the point was to demonstrate how much God has done for the children of Israel and, and, and give God that credit and that honor and the respect and glory for, for driving out the inhabitants. That was the point of that. It doesn't mean that every single one of their enemies had been, you know, have fled and been defeated. But that's not because of God. That's because of the children of Israel not finishing their job and not actually going in to fight. But God, in every single instance, has done his part. But it, when you just read the passage, it's not going to bring up all of those other things that haven't been done because the whole point is to give God credit for everything that he's done, right? I mean, it makes sense. But it's, it has nothing to do with... with different, you know, like misinformation or anything like that. You know, people who want to attack the Bible and they're going to find any way they possibly can because they don't understand it to begin with and uh, they don't care to look deeply enough into it, which you don't have to look that deep to get this understanding. It's not like some hidden mystery. It's, it's pretty simple to read if you actually care about his word and you just read it for what it says. Uh, Joshua 13, 1, you have to turn there. It says, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. So this is what we're seeing now. Joshua was old in Joshua 13. Joshua was old in Joshua 23 and stricken in years, but there's still work to be done. So now the children of Israel are finishing the work that they needed to, to, to get done. They're, they're going to possess the rest of the land. So let's keep reading here in Judges. Go back to Judges 1. Verse number three says, And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. And if you, weren't, if you were here for the chapter in Joshua, I covered this already, but Simeon had their inheritance completely inside the inheritance of Judah. So, so because Judah was given more land than they needed, in their inheritance, just for their size and everything, Simeon was given their portion within the borders of Judah. So, and, and I covered this before. I'm not going to get into that again. I'm just making mention of it in case you missed it during Joshua. So, because Judah is the one that should go up according to the Lord to go and fight against the Canaanites, Judah is saying, "Well, hey, why don't you guys just come with us? And then when you go to, into you know to fight your battles, we'll go with you. I mean, they're they're right next to each other, anyways. It makes sense, and and I don't think there's any problem with this either. They, Judah still goes up first, but he also asked Simeon to help him out. So um, it says there. So Simeon went with him. Verse number four. And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they slew of them in Bezek ten thousand men." And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, 
And they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. I think this is a very interesting, just kind of a, a side note here of what's going on. Now, it tells us a few different things that there still were some, I, I mean, I would consider this a significant battle for Judah to go and fight. I mean, if, if, if this king had already defeated 70 other rulers and 70 other kings, and he had lifted up himself, and he did this weird thing where he would cut off their thumbs and their big toes just to put them down a little bit more, right? just to hold it over them. I mean, I don't know who comes up with this stuff, like why, why you would do that, but that, that's what he did to kind of, that's what he was known by. He's like, well, I did this to 70 kings and they had their meat. So he didn't kill them. Because it says that they, got the, they gathered their meat under my table, right? Under my table. He, he really, like, like, put them low. And I think that's, that's probably literal. Like, like, he probably ate a table and, like, would make these kings grovel at his table for food. But isn't it interesting how it comes back on him. And this is a principle that's taught in Scripture. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter number 6. And this is a little, kind of an interesting little story. It's only got a couple verses, but it's something that's, that would be good, that many people do well to remember what happened to this king that was inflicting these things on other people, how it came back around to him. Now, oftentimes when we go out soul winning, a lot of people might tell you, oh, I believe in karma probably heard that before. Right? I hear that all the time. People say, oh, I, I kind of believe in karma. And I don't give people real hard time for saying that, but I do always correct them about the truth because karma is not true and of God in the sense that karma is taught. But what the Bible teaches is very similar there's similarities to the teachings of karma, and that is found in Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And in Hosea 8, 7, the Bible says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk, the bud shall yield no meal. If so be it yield, the stranger shall swallow it up. There is, there is a teaching in Scripture that you know, what goes around comes around. That when you start doing evil, or if you lay a trap or a snare for someone, that you're going to get caught in that trap. When you do bad things, bad things are going to come back around to you. And the reason why, it's not because of some universe and, and yin yang or anything like that it's because God is not mocked Amen. that's why because everybody that thinks they could get away with this stuff and be all proud and lift it up in themselves and do and think they could do whatever they want God's not going to be mocked like that he's going to make sure it comes back around on their own head and that, and that they'll fall in their own trap and we see here with this, this king, you know, he was cutting off thumbs and toes. Well, look what happened to him. He thought he was all high and mighty for a long time. And then, and then there he is in that same situation. And I think what we learn from that, go back to Judges 1. What we learn from that is just be careful with how you live your life and the things that you do. You know, if you ever get in positions of power, or authority or anything like that, you better treat people right and treat them with respect and treat them with dignity no matter, you know, what position you're in. Because when you start treating people poorly, it's going to come back to you. God's not going to be mocked. And when you start sowing to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption according to the Bible. But if you sow to the Spirit, the, but see, there, there's two sides to that coin. 
Obviously, we don't want to be sowing bad things because then we just got to worry about, oh man, what's going to come back to me? What's going to come back on my own head? And honestly, there's, there's some things that I think, and, I, and, and I've, I've believed this for a real long time, because I've often thought like, man, I don't feel like I've necessarily reaped for everything that I've sown. Like I could think back and just think of sins and just be like, you know, God's been very merciful, but I'm still worried because what happens when you sow is that you don't reap the next day. You don't reap immediately. This king, I mean, he had defeated, what is 70 kings, right? It took a while to catch up to him, but it did catch up to him. When you do evil, and this is what, one of the bad things that will oftentimes get people to continue to sin and get worse and worse, because just because you go out and sin today and you do something you know is wrong, you do something I know I shouldn't be doing, you could go, well, nothing happened. I'm okay, right? And then another week goes by. And you're thinking, you know, Pastor Burzins was like screaming his head off about this being a sin. If it's so bad, how come nothing's happened to me? Because you don't reap immediately. And don't let that deceive you. Don't let the lack of that reaping that doesn't happen immediately deceive you. Because what's going to happen is that it's going to embolden you to continue to sin and it's going to get worse and worse. You need to check yourself and say, hold on a second. The Bible teaches that God's not going to be mocked and I will reap what I've sown. And I think, but, but here's the thing though, is that when you think back of stuff that you've done in the past, like I think about what I've done. I've already confessed and forsaken my sins. In my heart, you know, like, like I've, I had to get that right with God myself. Now, I don't think that necessarily means that I'm not going to receive for some of the things that I've done. But I also look at it like this. And, and, and I, I, I apply what, I, what happened to the Apostle Paul. He had done all kinds of bad things in his life, you know, especially before, you know, before he got saved, persecuting the church, bringing all these things against Pete, you know, just, just all this persecution was kind of the big thing that, that he was doing that was just really bad. Well, what happened to Paul? He ended up receiving a lot of persecution. He was, I mean, go through the list of, of you know, I was a night and a day in the deep. I was, um, you know, in perils among robbers and perils among brethren. You know, I was stoned. I was, you know, all these different things happened to him. Now, the difference is, though, is that he got to go through those things and it all brought glory unto God. So in, in a sense, and, and I'm not dogmatic about this. This is just the way that I see the scripture. Just so you understand, I'm not saying that, that, that I'm 100% right about this and that, you know, there's no other way to understand this. But I think that there's a way for him to be able to receive what he's done in his flesh and reap what he sows. But then because he's doing right and because... You know, the Bible says that all things work together for good to them that love God, for them that are called according to his purpose. Because he loved God then after those things and wanted to do what's right, even though he's, he is kind of reaping for that, he, he's also able to use that then for the furtherance of the gospel and for the glory of God. And ultimately, I think that he ends up, he'll end up, you know, with more crowns as a result, too. I'm not, and I'm not saying don't, don't go out and get in sin so you could be, you know, get, get all this persecution laid on you. The persecution can come either way. I just see it as there's, there's kind of multiple things can be going on in people's lives. So um, the most important thing, though, is to, is to confess and to forsake those sins and, and to get them right. But what I was saying when I started going into this a little bit was that there's two sides of that coin, though. So as much as you need to be careful not to get into too much sin because you will reap. And every time you reap, you reap even more, right? So you don't just get back the one bad thing that you did, it's going to come back as, as, you know, like when you plant a seed and it brings forth fruit, it brings, back, you know, tenfold, fiftyfold, a hundredfold is going to come back to you because that's what happens when you reap. You don't just reap one seed back that you sown. You reap back a lot more. That's the bad side of things when you sin. It's, it could come back to you real bad. You, you sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. The whirlwind is way stronger than the wind. But on the flip side is when you're sowing good, 
when you're doing right, when you're going out and winning souls, when you're reading your Bible, when, when you're doing the things that God wants you to do, hey, don't forget that you will reap. And in the same sense that when you sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind, when you sow to God, when you sow righteousness, you're going to reap that much more the, the, the glory of God, the, the, the crowns, the whatever it is that God wants to bless you with. For doing those things a little bit of investment goes a real long way but we have to maintain the faith because those rewards you probably won't see in this lifetime so you have to know that all the sowing that you're doing you have to see through the eyes of faith that when you're going out and sowing the word there's gonna be a harvest one day and not just the harvest of, of reaping souls to Christ but the harvest of receiving from the good that you've done in your body, that's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ. When our works are tried, and, the, and the, the good works and the bad works, the bad works are burned up, but the good works abide the fire. And it doesn't say what your reward's going to be, but I think it's going to be a lot more in, in value or worth than what you would say that one individual seed that you, you had sown was that was good. Because that's the way that God works. It's the way that God operates. That's why it says, whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So it's a good principle to remember and to help keep ourselves, one, to keep ourselves right with God by, but two, to remember and to keep us motivated to do good because there is that reward it's another motivation to keep doing right you know people i've heard people ask us before out soul winning well what's what's the point of doing good then right because they'll, they'll think well if you don't have to be, do good to go to heaven then why be good why listen to god why do you read your bible why do you go to church i mean if you don't have to do those things to go to heaven then why do you do it <laughs> there's a lot of reasons to do it one, I don't want to be chastened and disciplined by God in this lifetime, let alone hell. I mean, I know I don't have to worry about hell, but I don't want to be punished by God in this lifetime. But two, I want to get some rewards. I want God to bless me. I want to do what's right. I want to live a blessed life. I want to have joy. I want to have peace. I want to have comfort and happiness. I want to have all these things. And you only get those by following the Lord. So, anyways, I don't want to get too far off on that rabbit trail. Let's get back to the chapter here in Judges chapter 1. Verse number 8, the Bible says, um, Now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain and in the south and in the valley. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba. And they slew Shishai and Hymen and Talmai. And from thence he went against the inhabitants of Deber. And the name of Deber before was Kirjith Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjith Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Axa my daughter to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Axa his daughter to wife. And it came to pass, when she came to him, that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted from off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And I have already preached on this when this was covered in the book of Joshua. So I'm not going to do that again. But I just want to point out here that very oftentimes, most of the time, when you see stories mentioned more than once, usually the story is going to give you a little bit more information you know, or different information from one account versus the other. And if you want to know a little bit more about these, then go and look up and read them side by side. And especially when you come across something, remember it, a, a, a good way or a fun way maybe to, to study your Bible out a little bit more than just doing basic reading. When you come across something that you know exists somewhere else in the Bible, try to find that other place and just, and just take a little bit of extra time, that little bit of extra time just comparing these two places. Maybe you won't come across with that much, but you probably will. If you look at them closely, you'll see, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that before. And it's going to make your understanding that much better. So just, you know, I encourage you to do that on your own. I, that's one of the things that I do when I'm preparing for sermons to try to teach is really dig in, to, especially on Wednesday nights when we go through verse by verse. 
I, I take a lot of time going through these passages and, 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 and finding all of the little, all of the other areas that, that reference these places to try to give you the, the, most, the best understanding that I can. But this is something that everyone can do on their own time to just help you understand the Bible even better. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 16, it says, And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Horma. Now, I also just want to make note of this. I don't have anything specific. I, I'm, I'm thinking right now of something to come to my mind that would be a really good example of this. But you'll also find areas of the Bible, especially like in the book of Numbers or in other areas, it might seem very boring. And you're like, why is this written in the Bible? Why is this recorded in the Bible? Why do we care about this? You'll see references to places or things that just, I don't understand why this is there. Oftentimes, the reason why things are there is to provide that little bit of extra information that can help you put more pieces together to give you a more full understanding of what's being taught elsewhere in the Bible. Now, why, the reason why I'm bringing this up right here, in verse 16, it says that uh, the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah. Now, you're like, well, what's the city of palm trees? Well, if you look that up, you're going to find that that's talking about Jericho. Jericho is known in the city of palm trees. And there's things that you can learn about Jericho that and about those stories and about these other things that you need to cross-reference in multiple places in Scripture in order to get this understanding. And, and again, I don't, I'm not having a good example just pop into my head right now, but I have had that time and time again where you need to find these little bits and pieces to understand what's going on. Even when before, when we were looking at like, uh, Kirjath Arba, right, this city. Well, Arba was, was the father of the giants. And, and, you know, Kirjath Arba, I think Kirjath is like son of Arba, or uh, Anak. No, Anak was of the giants, right? So you have, you, you have multiple places in Scripture that, that give you these little bits of information. And then when you see, you know, the children of go into battle, it doesn't mention necessarily that there's giants there, but then you can infer that, no, there really are. This actually is a big deal. This is this type of battle? Whatever. You, you gain this extra information. You get more intimate with the knowledge of the Bible. It's going to help you to learn more and understand more about what's going on. And especially when you, what, the, the more, and when I say intimate, like you, the more you can put yourself in the situation and just understand more details, when you're reading and studying the Bible, being a part of the story and, and, and just having that much more knowledge, it's going to help you make the applications of what you learn better because you're going to feel more like you understand what's going on in real life because these are real people's lives. I mean, these, these are men that are going out to battle or whatever, whatever the story may be. They're like you and me. They've got strengths and weaknesses and emotions and there's things going on in their lives and they're facing these events. And, and we need to remember not just to read these stories as just some story. And in many cases, what, what's being taught can be very obvious, but it's easy to look at certain people when you're reading it in a book and just be like, oh yeah, these people, I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know why the children of Israel were so, you know, the, why they're so whiny and why they, why they uh, you know, were, were disgruntled all the time and stuff. But you really need to think about where they were at and what was going on and, and kind of place yourself there. And, it's, and it's, the, the point of that is not to say, um, not to have pity on them in the sense that like what they did was shouldn't have been punished or something like that, but it's, it's to give ourselves the, the, the reality and understanding that, hey, we could do the same things. So we need to watch out for that and, and you know, kind of let it sink in and hit home. And the more you feel, you get, you get a better intimate knowledge of the places in the Bible, how far they are, you know, it, it all will help your total understanding of God's word. It really will. And I don't think you need to go and study 
history books to get that knowledge. In fact, they'll probably steer you the wrong way because you don't know if what you're reading is true or if it's some Jewish fable or whatever, right? Who knows? But we do know that every single word of God is true. And whatever it is that God wants us to know, we don't have to reference the wisdom of man in order to understand what God wants us to know. But if we just spend our time studying his words and studying these stories and really getting to know them and just going over and over and over, then you will be able to get the information and knowledge that God wants you to know. And you'll be able to get everything that he wants you to know just from his text in the language that you speak. And in our case, that's the English language, which is the preserved word of God in the King James Bible. So let's keep going here. That was kind of, um, there's nothing specific in the text here that, that I want to point out other than just this is a general theme in, you know, just with reading the Bible. Uh, let's keep going here. Verse number, I don't know where I was, I think number 17. And Judah went with Simeon his brother, and they slew the Canaanites and inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. And the name of the city was called Hormah. Also Judah took Geza with the coast thereof, and Ashkelon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Now, this isn't saying that God could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. This is saying that Judah could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. And this is just kind of thrown in there, but this is not the first time that we come across this issue. This is not the first time that the children of Israel are worried about people who have chariots and they're scared because they think that their might is greater. And one thing that we can take away from this is that how many times do they win victories from the Lord, yet they still get scared? They still have a problem when faced with what they think is just, man, they've got superior military power, whatever. Time and time again, we saw last week at the end of Joshua, how many times did God just fight their battles for them and they, they win, they win, they win yet they're still worried about that. And again, it's easy to condemn them and say, oh, well, how could you do that? But let's just remember that maybe that could happen to us too. You could have many victories in your life and sometimes it's just as easy as you could go from having victory, victory, victory to just all of a sudden getting real scared about some event in your life. It just looks to be too, too overwhelming, something you can't tackle, something you can't do. But we're going to see here the teaching and, and how many people this affected? Chariots of iron. Now, you're not going to be confronted with chariots of iron probably in your lifetime. Or not a chariot, at least. I mean, who knows? Maybe you could be confronted with a tank or an LRAD or something like that, right? That, that's, that's opposing you. But let's learn from this story here. And, and we see that Ephraim and Manasseh Flip, keep your place here. Flip back to Joshua 17. We covered this a little bit in Joshua 17, but let's, I want to go over it again here real quick. Ephraim and Manasseh also had the fear of chariots, but they were told to go and fight anyways. See, in this instance, we're talking about Judah not being able to drive out the inhabitants of the valley. Look at Joshua 17, verse 14. The Bible says, And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto? And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Prizites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. And the children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. Both they who are of Beth Shean and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people, and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine. 
For thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. And I preach a lot on this when we did Joshua chapter 17 about how, you know, you don't need to worry about the chariots of iron. Just go out there and do it. And Joshua's instructing them to go and do it. But you know what we get when we get to Judges chapter 1? They didn't do it. This place is actually, even though it was, he was speaking to the children of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, in Joshua 17, and now in Judges 1, he's talking to Judah about, or he's not talking to them, but, but Judah's the one who didn't go down because of the, and couldn't defeat him because of chariots of iron. It's actually the same place that he's referring to, this, this valley that had the chariots and these strong defenses. Judah, as I just mentioned, were given, according to Joshua, were given more land than they needed. Right, which is why Simeon also dwelt among Judah. Ephraim and Manasseh, the children of Joseph, they were big. And they're saying here, hey, we need more land. It makes sense that he's saying, okay, well then take this land because it borders yours. And you can get this land that originally was given to Judah and dwell there. If, if, if that's not enough for you, then go ahead and you can go ahead and take the hill and everything. And they said, well, wait, they've got chariots of iron. He says, I don't care. Go ahead and do it. I mean, if you need more land, then go ahead and do it. But you know what we see? They didn't do it. And I'll prove to you that they're the same. It's the same land because in Joshua 17, verse 16, they mentioned Beth Shean and Jezreel. Those are the two places that they mentioned that have the, uh, the chariots. And it says they're the valley of Jezreel. Well, Jezreel was given to Judah. And you can see that in Joshua, and I forget what chapter it is, maybe uh, 13 or 14. You could go back and see where, where the, the, in, the um, inheritance is divvied up to Judah, and you will find Jezreel in that list. Jezreel's there, it's given to Judah. Yet here he is, Joshua is telling Joseph and, uh, the children of Joseph to go and inhabit Jezreel. Jezreel was given to Judah. The tribe of Joseph was complaining they needed more land. Joshua tells them to go and take it. They didn't do it, which is why after the death of Joshua, we see, well, Judah wasn't able to do it because, because they didn't take it. It was still belonged to Judah. But then Judah didn't go and get it either because they were all scared of these chariots. Neither Joseph nor Judah took Jezreel, which was originally given to Judah, and Manasseh did not take Beth Shean. Beth Shean was originally given to Manasseh. That, that was their town to inher inher in inherit. Uh, Judges 1.27 says, Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor Taanach and her towns, nor inhabitants of Dor and her towns. Nor so it's listing off all these different places, but it mentions Beth Shean. They both blamed it on the chariots. But was it really the chariots to blame? No. It's their own lack of faith. And let's let that sink in because you can have victory after victory. They were all there at the crossing of the Jordan River. They were there when the walls of Jericho fell down. They were there when, you know, for every single victory. They were there when God sent the hornets before them. They were there when, when, when every enemy fell. But they still let this, this facade of strength deceive them. You think back in your life, I'm sure you've had many victories. I hope you have had many victories that God has helped you to win in your life. That you could go, wow, that's miraculous. I could think back of just even since I started pastoring and things like that and just different events and the way they played out that I wasn't quite sure how things were going to go. And then looking back, having that, that, that hindsight to go, wow, this is actually really amazing how everything worked out. I can see that God led me. I didn't know necessarily at the time what was going on, but I can see that. But don't, let's not forget all of those great victories when you're facing whatever it is that you're facing at the moment, whatever it is that seems to be that difficult challenge that I, I don't know what I could do here and then rely on your flesh or just get scared and, and maybe just abandon the battle. Just forsake it. Well, we, I, we can't go and get that town. 
which then ends up being a thorn in their flesh and it just causes more problems later because they didn't deal with it when they needed to deal with it. They didn't just, just roll up their sleeves and just say, well, we're going to do it. And it's not going to be by our strength because they may be stronger than us. They've got chariots, fine, but we're going in the name of the Lord. Try to remember these stories. When you feel overwhelmed, when you feel just like wh whatever it is, spiritual or not, like whatever that big thing is, that, that, that big chariot that's standing in your way, keep these things in mind and, and try to have the faith that the children of Joseph and the children of Judah did not have in these instances to be able to push forward and just say, well, it's all of God anyways. Um, even in God's law, you turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 20. And this just really drives the, the hammer home because God already specifically mentioned instances just like what they faced, exactly like what they faced. It was already in their law. They already should have known it. And I think they did know it in the sense that they at least heard it because it wasn't that much time between Moses gave them that law and they're out fighting these battles. Deuteronomy chapter 20, look at verse number one. The Bible says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And it goes on and on then through that chapter of how like, hey, if there's anyone that just got married, send them home. If there's anyone that just bought land, you know, send them home. If there's any reason why anybody shouldn't be here, just send them home. And if there's anyone that's fearful, send them home. Why? Because... If the battles of God anyways, let's not let these people bring the morale of everyone else down. Let's just use the people who are willing to fight and God will still win the victory. Because it's not our own, you know, if it was your physical strength, you'd be like, no, we can't. You'd be begging the people not to leave, right? <laughs> but, if it's, but if the battle is of the Lord, you'd be like, see ya. You're scared? You don't want to fight? Then go ahead. Go home. We don't want you here. We want real men of God. They're going to stand up and stand for the truth and stand for righteousness and move forward in the battle. And this is what the Bible teaches. And this is what Deuteronomy 20 teaches. And this is what they should have known. Because it was literally spelled out for them. Don't be afraid when they have chariots. Yet they were. Now look. Did they do a lot of other great things? Of course they did. They had lots of victories, the children of Israel, in, in, in so many other areas. And in general, they, they were able to, to subdue the land, right? And get their inheritance and, and be at peace. But there was too many places left over which ended up being a cancer to them and, and destroyed them you know, from within. Let's flip back to... Um, Judges chapter 1, there's, that, there's, I'll read this for you as you're going back to Judges 1, because they've already even had an experience of being delivered literally from chariots by God years earlier than, what, than the events that I'm referencing here about them saying, oh no, they have chariots in the valley. In Joshua 11 verse 4, the Bible says, and they went out they and all their hosts with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude, with horses and chariots, very many. And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Miram to fight against Israel. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them, 
For tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hawk their horses and burn their chariots with fire. And you know what Joshua did? He listened to God and they won the victory there. But there is an instance in their lifetime. They're faced with this huge multitude of people and chariots and horses. And, you know, this is a great force. But they, they defeated them. But then when it came down to doing it later on, all of a sudden it was too much for them. Now, we're going to close with this, and, and I'm not going to read through necessarily all the rest of these verses. Actually, I, I am. I'm gonna, we're going to go through a little bit more. Uh, there's one main point that I want to get to, though. Let's keep reading here in... Um, Verse number 18. Also Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ascalon with the coast thereof, and Ekron with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses said, and he expelled thence the three sons of Anak. And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites and inhabit Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Um, Skipping down, it's going to say they also went up against Bethel and the Lord was with them. And then it gives us this extra information about Bethel used to being called Luz. And again, this is another one of those bits of information that you may or may not be able to learn a lot just from this one passage about Bethel or about Luz. But when you put it all together, it's going to be very important to understand that Luz used to be, you know, Bethel used to be called Luz. And then this one tells you that there's another city that's called Luz. And this helps you understand, hey, Luz used to be Beth, you know, Bethel used to be Luz, but now there's this new Luz over here. It's, you know, it's a different city altogether, so you don't get the two confused. And it gives you the whole history of that. And you can read that, but I want to skip through that. Look at verse number 27. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor Taanach and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblium and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And this kind of starts off in verse 27. The different tribes that just, they weren't able to drive these people out. They weren't able to drive these people out. So last week we saw the kind of the main theme was how Joshua's life is, is you know, everything's being summed up of how, how many victories and how much God was with them and all the great things that God did for them. In this chapter, the theme kind of seems to be, especially this whole latter half of the chapter, are all the failures. And this tribe, they couldn't drive out the Canaanites, and they couldn't drive out the Canaanites, and they couldn't drive out the Canaanites, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And I think this is kind of interesting because this is the first chapter where it's after the death of Joshua. We're starting to hear about all these places where they just couldn't get the job done. And what else is interesting is when you look at it, now it's not 100%, but when you look at it, in verse 29, it mentions Ephraim. In verse 30, it's Zebulun. Verse 31 is Asher. Verse 33 is Naphtali. And then in verse 34, it's Dan. And of all of those that are mentioned there, these are, the, these are the tribes that were slack to get their inheritance while Joshua was around. And I don't think that's a coincidence that all these people that just didn't go to and had just to go and finish the job and get their inheritance while Josh, because while Joshua was there, he was a great leader. He was someone that was pushing them to just finish the job and get it done. And then when, when he's gone, they kind of lack that extra, they, they do a lot of good, but they lack the extra push, that extra effort to get the job done. And a good leader is there to help you to just improve that much more and to kind of push you to do the, the go the last mile, do a little bit more. And that's another reason why it's important to get into a good church. A good church, not just any church. I mean, you should go, you need to be in church no matter what, but try to get into a good church where you're going to be pushed. Because you can do some good things on your own. You can get a lot of victories. You can, you can work for God. You can get some things done. It can happen. It's possible.
but you're going to get way more done and you're going you're going to when you can get into a church that's going to push you just to go that little bit more when you got other people encouraging you, you got other people around you giving you that motivation and a leader that could just be like hey we're going to do this yeah i know we just did this and this is we're going to go and do a little bit more we're going to continue getting the work done and this is something that once Joshua is out of the picture, now we have all these people, all these tribes, they just, they didn't finish the job. They didn't get it done. And they could have. Every single one of them could have completely won. No, why? Because God's, God didn't decide to just say, well, I'm not with these people anymore because Joshua's gone. That wasn't what God's, God's willing to, to work with anybody. They just need to have the faith and do it. None of these people were, strong, were, were stronger than God. <laughs> None of them. I'll just read you from uh, Joshua 18, verse 2 says, And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are you slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given you? And in chapter 18, you could go back and read the different tribes that didn't, read, didn't receive their inheritance and compare that in Judges chapter 1 here. Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, Dan, all these ones that are mentioned that, well, they weren't able to drive them out. They weren't able to drive them out. It's kind of interesting. One last lesson I think we can learn from this is, you know, when we've got a job to do, especially from God, let's, let's finish the job. Let's not say it's good enough. They said it's good enough. When they were strong, they had their, you know, these people under tribute. They had, they had dominion over them. They had control over them. But they didn't, they didn't retain control over them all the time. There were, there were plenty of times in their history where the enemy got strong and then they became weak. And it's because they didn't just deal with it and get it out the first time. And I preach an entire sermon about that concept through the book of Joshua as well, where, you know, if it comes to sin in your life, things like that, whatever it is, whatever it is, let's not be double-minded. You know what's right to do. Let's just, let's get the job done. I hate half-finished jobs. I hate it. It drives me nuts. Like, and, and oftentimes it just takes that little bit of extra effort. You, could, you feel like you've come so far. Don't settle and just be like, well, that's good enough. If there's still work to be done, just finish it. Just take the time and just say, like, this is done. It's complete. Then move on to the next thing. Because otherwise it could turn around and bite you. And this definitely turned around and, and bit the children of Israel, leaving the, the heathen in the land to learn their ways, for them to drag them down, start worshiping other gods, lead their hearts astray, get them, you know, the influence of the world. Um, it is all bad for them. They should have just finished what God had for them to do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the great teachings that we can learn from your words. God, I pray that you would please just help us to be better students of the Bible, not just to read the Bible, but also to study it, dear Lord, and that you would help us to really get to know your words very well. Help us to retain this information. Help us to uh, commit your words to memory and that, and that we would be able to um, just understand and know that much more. And, and as we put forth the effort and the work, God, we just ask for you to bless that effort and that work and help us to be very fruitful here. And God, we love you.